I'm so happy you mentioned it just being tiresome, being exhausting. Yeah. So part of, very interestingly, when I first came to Turkey, I think there was almost a, there was almost a healing process for me where I just needed to get out of the West. And it took me a good three, four years of just sort of reflecting to sort of really heal from that, from the pressures of just constantly being under that pressure. It's, it's, it's a lot of psychological pressure. There's a growing movement in Europe and North America to reconsider where the future of Muslim communities lie. In recent years, a host of security and social concerns have brought to question just how much Muslims can maintain their commitments to Islam and live peacefully in a society that constantly looks for opportunities to marginalize Islamic practice. The liberal state is intent on secularizing and liberalizing Muslims. This has led to a call for hijra or migration away from the West and back to the Muslim world. But this is fraught with many difficulties. Many Muslims have little connection with the Muslim world and may in fact have acquired implicit Western tastes that alienate them from the country of destination. Today we explore these issues surrounding hijra from the West. My guest today is Thomas Abdul Qadir, who is the former president of the Majlis of Istanbul Muslims, an organization that caters for foreign Muslims living in Istanbul. They organize talks and activities to foster a community in this huge city. He has a master's in civilizational studies from Ibn Khaldun University and is currently pursuing traditional Islamic education. Thomas Abdul Qadir, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome to The Thinking Muslim here in Istanbul. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullah. Well, it's great to have you with us and I know we're going to have a very interesting discussion today about Inshallah. the concept of hijra as well as hijra and what it means to many Muslims who live in this city. I've noticed in my, my journeys from, from various parts of Istanbul, there are mm. a large number of Muslim, let's call them expats that live in mm. this city that are come from the West and, and maybe even come from further afield. So. I want to explore their motivations today, but let's talk about yourself first. Mm. Uh, you've been in Istanbul for a number of years. I mean, what brought you here? What brought mm. you to this city? Uh, so ironically, when I first came here, it was not actually for the sake of Hijra. Mm. And sort of, um, I was studying Arabic in Egypt in, uh, I guess this is 2014. Right. And I came here to Turkey for a visit. It was the last week of Ramadan in Eid. Yeah. I stayed here maybe about two weeks and uh, I just fell in love with the country. Mm -hmm. And I said, I want to live here. I'm going to come back here. Okay. So I went back to the States. I finished my undergrad. Um, and then as soon as I finished my bachelor's, I uh, decided to move here to Turkey. So I came here and uh, originally I was only planning to do uh, a gap year, as they call it. So I was planning to do one year. Yeah. And then uh, Allah's Qadr had uh, other plans for me. So it's been uh, nine years now. It's been nine years you've been in Istanbul. And, yes. and and for most of that time, you've been pursuing education in this city. What's been yeah. your So when I first came here, I was working. Okay. So I taught English, which is a, uh, a, is a very common job for foreigners in, yeah. in Turkey. Yeah. So I taught English at first. And then uh, I went, I pursued my master's. So I started a master's at Boazici University, actually, mm -hmm. which is um, probably the most prestigious university in Turkey, but it's quite secular. Mm -hmm. So I was um, disenchanted with the environment and the university. And I left that and mm -hmm. then I went to Ibn Haldun, where I finished my master's. Um, and then uh, ever since finishing my master's, I've just been working and um, trying to be a talib al Great. I mean, I, I've noticed that uh, Istanbul and, and Turkey, maybe, unlike most countries in the Muslim world, uh, there is not a... People do not f speak English uh, on a very large scale. Right. I mean, I think I heard a statistic that almost 80% of, of mm. Turkish Muslims, Turks, uh, do not speak a second language. I mean, how mm. much has that affected your ability to integrate, let's call it right. that, into, into Turkish society? Well, it... It hasn't affected me personally yeah. because when I came here, um, I came with the intention of learning Turkish. Uh -huh. so I basically just landed. I stayed with some friends and I started hitting the books like right away. Yeah, because I had that intention of learning Turkish. But yeah. it is, it is definitely one of the practicalities um, about thinking about hijrah to Turkey. Is mm -hmm. like, you know, maybe you can find a bubble where you can just speak English or Arabic right. for the first year. But yeah. at some point, if you're serious about staying here, yeah, maybe not even 
over the long term, but even over the short term, I would suggest learning Turkish. And why not? Um, at the end of the day, it, so for a lot of people, um, they are maybe not as enthusiastic about learning Turkish because mm -hmm. it's not the language of the Quran. Mm -hmm. So for a lot of Muslims, they're like, I would rather learn Arabic. At least I could learn more Quran. But Turkish at the end of the day is also, uh, in my opinion, is it's an Islamic language, yeah. an Islamic hit language. It allows you to communicate with other Muslims. So, Yeah, I mean, I, I've noticed that there are a number of uh, Western expats here, uh, mm -hmm. Western migrants who've come to the city, and they haven't necessarily picked up Turkish. And I think they use the excuse that it's a difficult language to learn. Mm -hmm. But of course, on a daily basis, just from going to yeah. the restaurant or you know, meeting uh, Muslims in your community, you probably mm. need Turkish, right, to to interact. Right. It's essential. I mean, and also, you don't need a super advanced level of okay. Turkish. You just yeah. need a level where you can communicate with people. Right. And that's also, I think Turkish is actually a very easy language. Okay. Um, there's an old Orientalist joke that um, Turkish starts off, um, that Persian starts off easy to learn, yeah. and then it becomes hard. Uh-huh. And that Turkish um, is hard to learn in the beginning, and then it becomes easy. Right. But Arabic is hard to learn in the beginning, and it's hard to learn at the end. It mm. stays hard. Yes. So um, definitely, I think that, you know, if you compare Turkish to Arabic, it's, it's much easier. Right. Definitely. So y you would say, I mean, you're proficient in Turkish. I've, I've noticed, and I've, I've walked with you in this city, and, and uh, you're able to interact uh, at a pretty so. high proficiency, it seems to me, with with the locals in, in Turkish. You can even joke with the locals. It's, it's A little bit, a little bit. I don't know. Alhamdulillah. Mm. Alhamdulillah. Well, okay. So let's talk about the wider picture. Paint a picture mm. of migrant life here in Istanbul for me, please. Right. So when we talk about Western Muslims migrating or making hijrah to Istanbul or to Turkey, mm. we're actually, we need to realize that that's part of two larger phenomena. Mm. And one of those is just is migration to Turkey in general. Mm. So it's not all just uh, Hijra or Muslims that are migrating to Istanbul. There's also wider migration to Turkey in general. So right. for example, um, a lot of people are aware of, for example, Arabs who are fleeing from political repression in their countries mm. following you know, post-Arab spring. Mm. But there's also, for example, there's people from the Balkans who are coming. Okay. There's a lot of people from Central Asia. Mm -hmm. And some of that is economic. Some of that can also be termed hijrah. Mm. A lot of the tulab al ilm in the city are actually from Kazakhstan or from Uzbekistan. Right. And they're unable to study Islam in their countries. And so they come here to study Islam. Uh -huh. And so when we, when we conceptualize of hijrah, I think we should conceptualize it in a wider sense. And it's not just it shouldn't become a synonym for uh, Muslim expats, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, which I actually want to, I want to challenge that term. I, I really don't like the word expat. What do you prefer? Migration. Okay. Migrants. Yeah. Why, why should we have a separate category for when Westerners migrate than when brown or black people or people from the third world migrate? Right. It's all migration. Yes. It's, this is Allah's earth and everybody is migrating perhaps for different reasons. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's the same. It's the same uh, phenomenon. It's right. migration. Yeah, I mean, let's separate out then the different types of migration. I mean, I hmm. do want to focus on Western migration, because for you know m most of my We're listeners, Western Muslims, right, right? Most of our listeners come from the West, and they are contemplating. I would suggest, uh, especially a lot of young Muslims are contemplating uh, moving to the Muslim world. Uh, but you you suggest that uh, there's migration from everywhere. So let's start yeah. with maybe uh, the fallout from the Arab Spring. I mean, where are these right. migrants coming from? Right. Is Syria, of course, looms yeah. lot high. I mean, we've got what Iraqis, Egyptians. Is that yeah. right? Are these a free top? Yeah. So uh, so we can we can put it into a couple of categories. Okay. So the first one that you just mentioned yeah. would be uh, political. Political oppression, okay. fleeing from political oppression. Right. And usually we would think of those people as refugees. Yeah. Of course, from an Islamic perspective, they're also mahajirs, right? Th that is literally exactly how we conceptualize of hijrah mm -hmm. in, the, in the Islamic tradition. Yeah. Um, so the largest, the single largest group is the Syrians, which is about 4 million less now. It's about, it's less than 4 million. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's much wider, and many of them also are not, um, are not legally categorized as refugees. Right. But if you look at it, they are fleeing political repression. Yeah. So you have Iraqis, which you're completely right. That's a very large group. You have yeah. Iraqis, you have Egyptians, a lot of Egyptians. Um, you have Libyans. 
Right. So, for example, when I was teaching English, my first year teaching English here, most of my students were actually Libyans. Really. And a lot of them were actually on tourist uh, residence permits. Yeah. So they were technically listed as tourists, but if you would talk to them, a lot of them were from the east of Libya. This was at the time of uh, Haftar's offensive. Yeah. And so um, a lot of them were going to Malaysia because they could get visas there and then they were coming to Turkey because right. they could also basically, these were the only two options for them. Right. So most of those have now gone back to Libya, but okay. that's that's something interesting where how do we... We need to think perhaps beyond just categories of refugee or, you know, we need to think beyond these categories, I think. So one is political repression. Another one is economic migration, mm. which is a very big one. Right. So I mentioned Africans. Um, obviously, a lot of them are Muslims. I see them. We pray in the mosque. We pray together. Mm. But then I also see Africans who walk around Istanbul and they literally have a cross mm. uh, as a necklace. So obviously they're not Muslims yes. and they're, they're just coming here for economic opportunities. Okay. Just fair enough. Right. Um, so economic migrants and that under that, you also have central Asia mm. and you have the Balkans, for example, as well. Um, so that's the second category. And then maybe the third category, which I guess is our main focus today yeah. is what you could term religious migration. Okay. Right. So that's what we think of as hijra right. usually. Yeah. Um, and, so obviously for us as Western Muslims, it's very interesting that we have West Muslims from the West who are migrating to Turkey, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but then, as I said, there's there's a wider there's there's a wider phenomenon going on here mm. of Muslims uh, coming to to Turkey and Istanbul in particular for religious reasons, right? Such as such as the Kazakhs and the Uzbeks and so on. So when you're on the ground, it's it's a much more mixed and diverse picture than you might get from outside. Someone uh, said to me, I was at a, a dinner yesterday and, and someone pointed out that Istanbul is very quickly becoming an ummatic city. And mm. that's a new buzzword, a new term. But yeah. I, I suppose what they meant by that is you've just got this rich tapestry of Muslims from all over the world who are yeah. coming to converging on this one city. And, and you know, his point was uh, this could be a a place for 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 genuine discussions about the future of the Muslim Ummah. Mm. I mean, how much of that is exaggerated? I mean, yeah. do you feel that when you interact with Muslims, mm -hmm. uh, as you said, from all over the world who converge onto in, into uh, onto this city? I mean, you definitely feel it on the ground. Yeah. Right. If you're if you're in those circles, you know, you definitely feel it where you're in a circle of friends and you're meeting people, Muslims from all over the world, and you're discussing your your uh, common problems as as Muslims, no mm. matter where you're from, and that you can connect with other Muslims, yeah. right? Um, just the other day, we both attended the Umatics conference, yes. right? And that's not the only one that was the first one from Umatics, but then you also have, for example, Sabah Din Zayim University yeah. has been hosting conferences on Ummah. They have um, an annual conference on Islamophobia. Yeah. Um, there's people here who do activism for the sake of Kashmir, for the Uyghurs, for Syrians, Palestine, yeah. so on and so forth. Right. So it's it's definitely there. I think it's also part of um, all, it's also part of globalization. Whereas, I and I don't think this was necessarily government policies. Mm. A lot of people think it is, and so when you read uh, articles in Russian media, yeah, they'll talk about it as sort of like an Ak Party project or something like that. And I don't I don't think that's very accurate. I think a lot of it was, you know, build it and they will come. But then the people who came are maybe not exactly who you thought was going to come. Right. right. So um, I think a lot of it is actually Muslims themselves making that choice. Why choose Turkey? What is it about Turkey or Istanbul in particular mm -hmm. that uh, allows that makes it a magnet for these uh, these migrants from around right. the world? So. We should have mentioned that Turkey is not the only option. Right? Okay. So if you're thinking seriously about Hijra, there's other options out there. Mm. There's, you know, maybe uh, Qatar, some people are going there. Yeah. You have Malaysia, as yeah. we mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, some people are currently making Hijra to Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. which a lot of people might not think, but yeah. is, is actually happening right now on the okay. ground. But I think Turkey is, I would argue, probably the best option right now. Really? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, for, for a religious-minded Muslim? Yeah, yeah. For a couple of reasons. Mm. So one is is simply geography, right? So if you look, 
Turkey's geographical location is right at the center of everything. Yeah. It's right at the center of Europe, Asia, uh, sorry, uh, Europe, Africa, and Asia, mm -hmm. right? It's right in the middle. So part of it is ease of access, right? Um, part of it is Turkey has a decent economy. It's had a, an economic downturn as of late. Yes. But when you compare it to the other options, it's still it's still quite attractive. Okay. Um, in terms of the standard of living that's possible, and I think I think maybe we should have that discussion about how standards of living is is perhaps I think decreasing in the West right now yes. and is increasing in other places. Right. One of those is Turkey. Um, and then the, the 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 third factor is is a more conservative life, right? right? And so it's it's the combination of those three. People may be surprised to hear that that you can yeah. you can live a more conservative. By conservative, you know, we effectively mean a more religious life, right? But right. people will be surprised to hear that because, of course, often our first exposure to Turkey is the tourist areas that we visit mm. when we're younger and we go to and you know, around yeah. Sultan Ahmed Masjid and Hagia Sophia, and they tend, those areas tend not to be very conservative. In fact, right. they also attract a lot of Western holidaymakers for precisely the reason that they would go to, say, Spain or Italy, because mm -hmm. they can have a, a, a good time. They can revel in, in mm -hmm. sort of party. And so, right. and cheaper, and cheaper than a lot of places. Cheaper than a lot of yeah. places. The, the currency at the moment is very advantageous for, for European Muslims and American Muslims, in, or, or Americans in general or, anyway. Yeah. But so, so why do you t do you argue that Turkey is is a better place for religious minded Muslims? Hmm. Yeah, no, I think I think you hit it on the nail. A lot of people, um, when when they come, so one thing you have to realize is that Istanbul, uh, other than Izmir, hmm. is probably the most secular place in Turkey. Okay, and it's the place most people come. Right, and then on top of that, one of the first places they go to is Sultan Ahmed, hmm. which you know I've been here nine years, so I've seen. The difference in in who is coming over the past few years has become more omatic in that sense. It's yeah. become there's more Muslims that are making up that percentage of people that are coming, yeah. whereas before it was basically pretty much only Germans, Russians, and Brits basically. Mm -hmm. And so the demographics of that aren't changing, right? So that's one thing where unfortunately, you know, a lot of these. It, it, it's quite ironic that, you know, you can get a view of a really beautiful view of Hagia Sophia and have a beer, you know, mm. while you, yeah. that's just how that neighborhood was. And a lot of people also don't realize that there's sort of an interesting system in Istanbul where it's understood, it's just understood that certain neighborhoods are more secular and certain neighborhoods are more conservative. Mm. And then of course there's places that are somewhere in the middle, like that's a very, it's not that binary, right? Mm. Um, but if you don't understand that system, you could maybe be shocked. Right. And I think a lot of Muslims um, come from backgrounds where they're sort of very sheltered. They sort of made a, a bubble for themselves mm. in the West, mm. uh, an ethnic enclave, really. Mm. Mm. And so when they come here, and Istanbul is a city of um, officially 16 million, more than that. Right. If you consider uh, non-permanent residents, it's mm. probably like 18 million people. Yeah. So yeah. that's just... 18 million people are not all going to be conservative Muslims, right. just obviously. So so you suggest that it, it is the most secular city uh, in... Uh, yeah, after in... after Izmir and maybe okay. Ankara as well. Okay, Yeah. right. So it tends to attract more you know, liberal-minded people, secular-minded people. No, there's, there's people. other... There's other uh, maybe I should amend that. There's other obviously quite secular cities in Turkey. Okay. It's just where most people come. Fine. Um, but yeah, I mean, the thing is... Um, there's a reason why Erdogan always wins. Yeah. And and a lot of people, part of why the Western media always get this wrong is because they just, they stay in Istanbul mm. and then they're surrounded by people. And then most of them don't speak very good Turkish. So they talk to people who know English. Uh -huh. And so just, they start getting the impression, oh, wow, everyone hates Erdogan. Mm. I was like, no, go to Anatolia. It looks mm. very different. Right. So, um, you know, um, you will have a very different picture of Turkey if you go to Borsa or if you go to Konya or you go to anywhere in the Black Sea, for example, mm -hmm. or even even the Kurdish areas, even though recently they voted for the opposition candidate, they're still quite socially conservative. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, if someone then wanted to make the move, so, you know, I yeah. came across Muslims who live in France and of course, France is, I think, uh, the repression against the Muslim community is, it, it, is at a very 
acute level. Yeah. Um, you know, some Muslims can't even practice their deen in a in a very basic way in France because of the uh, the restrictions from the from the state. Um, so, if a a French Muslim wanted to come mm. to Turkey, uh, are you suggesting that Istanbul would not be a good place for them, and maybe they should be thinking about uh, other cities? Like, mm. how 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 should they navigate this uh, potential problem that mm. they may face in with with uh, a secular neighborhood in Istanbul? Mm. Well, I think. Part of it is just doing your research before you come. So there are right? different neighborhoods you're suggesting. Yeah, yeah. there's uh, okay. different neighborhoods. Yeah. And so it used to be a lot of people were going to Fatah and mm. Bashak Shahir. Yes. And those are not really options anymore because of the change in laws. Yeah. So now I would say that if you're if you want to come to Istanbul, there's still uh Uskudar, Umraniya, and yeah. Ayyub are good options. Yes. Um but yeah, I think on the Istanbul versus not Istanbul question, it's a lot of what do you want? What right. are you personally interested in? Yes. So a lot of people may not be interested in Istanbul just because it's a big city mm. and you have big city life and some people want to get away from that. Mm. In that case, then there's other options out there. Um, mm. You can look at Borsa, you can look at Konya. Yeah. Um, if you have enough money to buy a car and a house and you're mm. interested in that, you can look into Yolova and Sakarya, yeah. which are smaller cities that are sort of within the orbit of Istanbul. Right. And, you know, it's a drive away from Istanbul. Okay. So you could sort of live in a small city, but then drive to Istanbul if, you know, you wanted to meet people or go to a conference or whatever mm. it may be. Right. Now, going back to the uh, the initial focus, I suppose, of, of today, mm. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in the number of the growing number of muslims from the west who have mm. decided to move to istanbul and other cities in uh in in turkey yeah um what what what's the scale of that i mean mm -hmm. i know i'm not sure if there have been any research studies into this or if we've mm -hmm. got a, an accurate picture but at least anecdotally it just seems mm. like more and more Westerners yeah. seem to be moving here. Is that yeah. is that fair to say? Is that from your end? Is that a similar picture? Yeah, I think that's think? very fair to say. Right. I mean, part of it is not only are there not numbers on this, it's like how would you even have numbers on this? Okay. Right. Because it's such a specific demographic, mm. right? Like how do you how do you have statistics on that? Mm. I think there's a couple of things. So I would mention, and I would mention this also to Western Muslims who already live here, yeah. is to realize you're still just a drop in the bucket in terms okay. of migration to right. Turkey in general. As we mentioned Syrians before, and, yeah, right. You and and like I said, Central Asians, uh, Africans, uh, Eastern Europeans, you're mm. still just a drop in the bucket, right? But even with that said, I would say that the scale I think would surprise a lot of people. Really? The scale of people who have already moved here, mm. and also the scale of people in the West who want to move here, right? And I think that there is actually a disconnect between um, the imams and the intelligentsia of Muslims in the West and a lot of the lay people in the West who actually really do have this desire mm. and you can see it increasing. Right. Um, and I think there's even now discussions on Hijrah that are, are actually increasing, whereas before it was sort of a very niche conversation. Yeah. Um, I think for a while, us as Muslims, um, because of the war on terror, there was a real attempt to sort of uh, divorce us from the rest of the Ummah. Mm. And we as Muslims, we were just trying to survive, really. We were trying to tread water. Yeah. And so we were always so busy proving that we're loyal to our nation state, you know, mm -hmm. uh, where a lot of people naturally in that environment just said, you know what, I'm going to prove I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not just an American Muslim. I can be an even better American than the Americans, mm -hmm. right? And that was the focus for, for a while, I mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm actually happy to see Maybe not, it's not so much about hijrah as much as it is about connecting back to the ummah okay. and, and reestablishing those links, right. right? Yeah, no, no, I think mean, that's a, that's really interesting. Um, you meet, uh, through your activities with uh, Istanbul Majlis, you meet yeah. a number of Western Muslims or a number of Muslims from Britain and France and United States. What are they telling yeah. you? Why are they mm -hmm. so alienated from Western uh communities or western life that they have decided to to pack up and move to to turkey right so i think there's two things hmm. one is the war on terror as i mentioned okay um so security and security and just, right. prevent in the case of the uk yeah or what french muslims are facing um 
So that's that's one. It's just sort of the overwhelming pressure that existed as Muslim minorities in the right, West, right. right? And the second one, um, you know, when you talk to people, especially anybody who's like over the age of let's say twenty seven or thirty, yeah, even some of the younger guys, I'll talk to, and they'll just say, "I don't want to raise kids in the West anymore." Uh -huh. They say, "I don't think it's an appropriate environment to raise children in anymore." Right. Um, I'll meet, I'll meet sometimes even young guys who are in their 20s, you know, 23. Not married yet. And he's not even married yet. Right. But mashallah, he's got a plan. He's thinking ahead, you know. Mm. Um, so he's saying, I don't want to raise kids there anymore. Mm. So I'm going to come here. I'm going to start up base. And then when I get married, I can, inshallah, have a more appropriate environment to raise a family in. That's the number one thing I'm, I'm hearing. So, so let me unpack that. So what is it about yeah. the environment in the West? Yeah that makes it hostile to to bring up an Islamic family? So there's two things. One, I think in general, when you look at popular media in the West, mm -hmm. I think it's become uh, much more blatant in a lot of things in terms of just uh, the level to which of, 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 uh, of nudity or partial nudity, mm -hmm. where it, it's just, it's crazy when you, com when you consider, even with what I grew up with, which obviously from an Islamic perspective, yeah. right, we're, we weren't okay with. But even when you compare that to what is out there today, it's, it's just such a huge gap. Yeah. And the second one is um, obviously the LGBTQI issue is, is a very pertinent one yeah. in the West yeah. and is very much the topic of the town right now. And um, I think for, even for a lot of Muslims, they were saying, listen, we had sort of an agreement where we said, okay, we understand that we live in the West and we understand that there are going to be people who live a certain lifestyle that we don't, that we don't even agree with. Right. And because we have liberalism, we can just sort of live together. Mm -hmm. We can just accept our differences. Mm -hmm. But I think, uh, I think most Muslims or uh, let's say a lot of Muslims today would find the way things are going now to be a blatant form of social engineering right. is the way they view it. Yeah. Um, some people may not agree with that. They think it's uncharitable, but this is sort of the uh, zeitgeist. Mm. This is just what um, the animus right now mm. in the era is that uh, they went too far. Right. Yeah. So, so these are Muslims who fear that uh, the trans agenda, the LGBTQ agenda, the social liberal agenda is going to impact the lives of their children and right. and, and you know uh divert them away from the dean and, and uh, lead them astray right um, and a lot of people maybe view this almost as sort of like a gateway drug right yeah. it's sort of like if you agree on this issue you start to adopt a more liberal philosophy and then that starts to undermine certain let's say your islamic worldview very yeah. clearly right yeah um I think a very interesting shift is is currently happening right now where because of because it was Republican presidents basically that were doing the war on terror mm. um, Muslims in America even though historically a lot of us voted for Republicans or were split evenly yeah during that period basically there was just a near ijma among American Muslims mm. that just out of practical necessity we're all going to vote for Democrats because right. You know, they don't want to kick us all out or they don't want to throw us all in prison, mm -hmm. right? Even though a lot of people understood that the, that there was a bargain, there was a, there was a trade-off happening there. Yeah. And I think a lot of people did understand that. But I think there's a shift happening right now. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned to you before this that uh, Fox News ran a segment about Muslim parents that were uh, protesting the issue of LGBTQI. And it was... I don't. I would be interested to see when the last time Fox News had a positive segment about Muslim was. Right. And to be to be very clear, I'm not a fan of Fox News, mm. so I, I'm not necessarily saying, "Oh, this is a wonderful thing. Let's all ally with the right." I don't. Yeah. I I think that Muslims should have uh, an independent stance between the two parties. Mm. But what I'm saying is, I think there's a shift that's happening there. Yeah. Um. Also, recently, Hamtrak. Yeah. which is the only Muslim majority city in the U.S. Yeah. I think it was the day before yesterday, Yeah, released a decision to, they basically banned all political flags on uh, city property. But that was widely understood to be a mechanism to basically ban the LGBTQI flag. And this is a majority Muslim council. Right. Right. 
And then, of course, the, the the if you read the article on it, it was, you know, they said, oh, we supported you when you were an oppressed minority. Why are you oppressing another minority? Yeah. So that's going to be the framing. So and um, especially with the presidential elections, I think they're next year, yeah. right? Yeah. With the elections next year, I think this is going to be one of the central issues. And how that's going to fit in with Muslims and with Islamophobia, I don't know. It's not very clear yet. So things are shifting very quickly. Yeah. And uh, you saw this also with Tate converting to Islam, right? Yeah. Uh, whether you agree with him or disagree with him, right? So this is part of a, a wider shift that is happening right now with Western Muslims, I think. So I think what you're saying is that um, life has become very complicated in the West. Um, there's a, There are a number of, of challenges that Muslims have to navigate on a daily basis. Sometimes they're going to have to make some compromises. Sometimes they're going to have to take a stand. And it's just, it's becoming very tiresome for some Muslims. They, you know, they have to put a lot of bandwidth into mm -hmm. the most mundane issues, the most basic <laughs> yeah, issues yeah. about bringing up their kids. Right. Um, does that level of complexity not exist here amongst, you know, in, in the Muslim community? Mm -hmm. Um. I mean, there's obviously a certain level of complexity in politics anywhere. Right. But there's not sort of that that level of complexity in how to navigate your daily life as a Muslim here. Okay. For sure. Really? That does not exist. Yeah. No. Um, I'm so happy you mentioned it just being tiresome, being exhausting. Yeah. So part of, very interestingly, when I first came to Turkey, I think there was almost a, there was almost a healing process for me where... I just needed to get out of the West and it took me a good three, four years of just sort of reflecting to sort of really heal from that, from the pressures of just constantly being under that pressure. It's, it's, it's a lot of psychological pressure. Right. So for me, that was, that was a transformative experience to sort of be away from the pressures of being a minority in America or anywhere in the West and mm. just sort of really reflect and to be honest for me those were you know what is colloquially referred to as jahiliya days or mm. the j days right mm. where to be honest i had a reckoning where i said what do i actually believe mm. do i just believe this because it's important for me to be an oppressed minority or do i believe in islam yes and so i went through a process and to be honest i wasn't as practicing and so for me it's very interesting i actually almost had an internal hijra inside istanbul uh -huh. where i decided to move from a more secular neighborhood to a more religious one as i said you know what i do believe in islam yes it's not just a uh, a language of of uh, resistance for me it's it's something deeper than that yeah and i want to live my lifestyle in accordance with Islam. And you feel that you couldn't have reached those sorts of conclusions where you were in, in, in the United States? Right. I mean, obviously lots of people do. Yeah. But that was just, that's just how it worked for me. For you, yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, I do think there's something to be said about just stepping out of of, of that uh, boiler pressure yeah. that, that we, we live in in the West. Now, you know, again, I, I want to come back to a point that early, I made earlier because if, uh, if I yeah. can interrupt, yeah, you, yeah. I, I do think it's important to mention that when we talk about hijrah as Muslims to Turkey or to anywhere else, obviously we realize that the level of repression that we face in the West is not the same as other Muslims. So let's right? talk about that. Well, let's yeah. talk about it. So hijrah as we understand it as Muslims is what the Prophet ﷺ went through of a journey between uh, Mecca to Medina Right. where he was fleeing immense persecution. He, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and his so, uh, Sahaba were fleeing immense persecution and they made a home in Medina, right? And they established a community. Um, and and uh, yeah, arguably, uh, Muslims in Britain do not face that level of persecution. They can right. fast, they can, you know, it's not like China. They mm. can pray, they have got massages. Or even France. Or right. even France. Okay, France maybe is an exception that we need to discuss, mm. but... What level of persecution does a Muslim need to face before we can, from a Shari'i perspective, call that mm, hijra? Right. So I think, I don't want to say that's an individual decision, but mm. it more or less is. Okay. Because you as an individual will be tested on the day of judgment. You will stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he will hold you to account for the degree to which you protected your religion mm. and to the degree to which you protected the religion of your family. Okay. So... Obviously, not all communities in the West or even all communities in America are the exact same. It, it changes and they face different challenges. Mm. So for me, you know, 
it's not feasible for everyone to make hijrah to Turkey. Yeah. Maybe it's just moving to a better city in the U.S. where there's a better community. And that's totally fine. I respect that. I respect that. I, for me, at the end of the day, it is you are responsible for your religion and for protecting it and for protecting the religion of your children. Yeah. So obviously the Quran is is littered with verses. There's just a plethora of verses talking about hijrah, specifically because of the hijrah from, uh, from Mecca to Medina. Mm. Um, one of the most interesting verses is about about hijrah the angels this is uh surah nisa i think it's uh, verse 97 okay so the angels are basically taking the souls of people who were wrongdoers mm -hmm. they had they had wronged themselves so the angels say to them say to them fima kuntum they say what state were you in mm -hmm. so then the people they basically offer an excuse and they say qalu kunna mustada'ifina fil ard uh, they say we were oppressed in the land, and then the angels say, "Qalu, um, alam tukun ardullahi wa siyatan fatuhajiru fiha." So the angels reply, they say, "Was not Allah's earth wide enough, spacious enough for you to immigrate therein?" Mm. Um, and then it says, you know, and then they will be sent to to the hellfire, right? So this is this is if you read this verse, it's telling you specifically you have no excuse on the day of judgment that, oh, I lost my religion because I was oppressed. That's not an excuse. Mm -hmm. Of course, the next verse is very interesting because then it says, um, um, I don't remember the exact words. It was, uh -huh. So except for those uh, oppressed, sorry, so except for those oppressed men, women, and children who basically weren't able to find a way. Hmm. So all the fatawa that even the ones that are pro hijrah will say, if you can't make hijrah, then you're not necessarily responsible for that. And that's that's part of a, a larger, the Sharia makes always exceptions if you're unable to do so. Just like if, you know, people with diabetes who can't fast, yeah. for example, right? This is durura. This, uh, durura, this is, yeah. right. Um, and then verse 100, which is the two verses later is very interesting mm. because it says, mm. So it says, and whoever immigrates in the path of Allah will find therein uh, many safe havens, will find many refuges, and abundance and resources. So Allah SWT is telling you in the Quran, if you make this intention mm. to make hijrah, mm -hmm. uh, you will find safe havens on earth. You will find uh, resources, right? But you have to make that intention, right? Um, and sometimes you have to be creative. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that, that's very interesting. So um, uh, a Muslim in France, and again, it, it's about specific realities. We can't yeah. make very broad generalizations, but a Muslim in France, it finds that they can no longer teach their child at home because it's now an obligation to send your child to a state school. Mm. Their local mosques are being shut down and their imams are being sacked for or quoting. Sweden, for example, oh, yeah. where their, you know, um, many children are taken through social services oh, and are no, taken no. away from their families. Yeah. Oftentimes for very, at the very least, you can say reasons in which there's not a lot of legal impuni impunity, right? Right. Um, so yeah, definitely. Um, and, and not only, so I'm not necessarily saying, oh, they, they should make hijrah. Yeah. Actually, they already are making hijrah. Yeah. And a lot of people don't realize that. Mm. So a lot of French Muslims, actually not many are coming here to Turkey. A lot of them went other places. So yes. a lot of French Muslims are going to the UK. Or Algeria or, or Morocco. Algeria, yeah. Morocco. Yeah. Um, or a lot of them went to Canada, for yeah. example, went to Quebec. Because yeah. they speak French there and that's yeah. easy. Yeah. And that's, that's totally fine. You know, you, so for me, it's like this. You are responsible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everyone has different situations. Yeah. Maybe it's not possible for you. If it is possible for you, it doesn't have to be Turkey. It can be, it can be Canada, maybe. Mm. You know, so can I ask an, a question of, of knowledge, of elm? Um, mm. Okay, so in Britain, we don't face that intensity of, of repression as Muslims say in Sweden or in in France, too. But of course, yeah. we do have this latent, you know, uh, uh, 
uh, assertive liberal, muscular liberalism that's trying mm-hmm. to take our children away from us, not a, in one quick blow, mm-hmm. but over a period of time. Right. A Muslim escaping that sincerely because he or she wants to uh, bring their family up according to the tenets of Islam, is that Muslim, uh, can that Muslim be qualified as a migrant in the Shari'i sense uh, mm-hmm. committing the action of hijrah? Right. So this is something I actually wanted to mention earlier when we were talking about uh, the hijrah from Mecca to Medina. Mm-hmm. So it's very interesting. Most of our fiqh discussions, obviously, be, just because of the context, discuss hijrah within the context of Dal islam and Dal al-Kufr, yeah. right? And that was, of course, um, there's a little bit of difference between the madhahibs on this. So three of the madhahibs were basically said, you do have to make hijrah with some nuance. And then the Shafi's actually had the fatwa that uh, you shouldn't make hijrah, or in some cases, what they said is they said, if you are the last Muslim in a place and you migrate from it, it's actually haram because huh? then then nobody is calling to Islam, then nobody is saying, you know, is spreading uh, God's good word, right? As, mm. as the Christians were there. Yeah. Um, so th- there is some variance on this, but I think there is actually, there is in our tradition, mm. there is an example of Muslims who made hijrah, not necessarily because this state was applying the Sharia, yes. which is when the Muslims migrated from, from, from Mecca, it was partially because of oppression, but it was also partially to establish a political community, True. right? That's why our calendar as Muslims yeah. starts from the Hijrah. It's yeah. when it's when the political community of Muslims was established. Yeah. But before that, the first Hijrah was not to Medina. It was actually to Habasha. It was to Abyssinia. Mm. And that they were actually non-Muslims, right? But they were assured certain rights. Mm. Um, and this is maybe only somewhat tangently uh, related, mm. but something that's interesting to think about here is, um, especially in the 2000s, there was there was a lot of rhetoric that oh, America is the Dar es Salaam now. Mm. It is. It gives us all of our rights. Mm. Um, but I think there's an interesting question to think about here. So w- when those people were using that rhetoric, they mm. were using a lot of the fatawa in our tradition that were um, against hijrah. But part of the reasoning there was they said if the, the condition they, they basically put was idhara din, mm. which is literally manifesting the religion. Now, it's a little bit ambiguous, but basically the idea of manifesting, there's an idea there of being able to publicly express Islam. Right. And I also think that just because they lived in the pre abandon era, um, it wasn't a nation state system. So you could have multiple legal systems. Mm. So I think when they're talking about Muslims having rights and they're talking about ifhar al-din, they're actually talking about collective rights. Right. Not about individual rights, which is what liberalism gives us as Muslims in the West. It yeah. says, okay, you as an individual have religious freedoms, but at no point are they saying you as a religious community have certain freedoms. Yeah. So for example, if we as Muslims in the West say, you know what, um, I want to be able to have the adhan because that's, a religious freedom that we have as a collective, mm. which is true, that's part of our Sharia. It's yeah. very clear, yeah. right? Um, that would not be a persuasive argument in mm. American court. I don't think so. No. You know, of course, a lot of the politics there happens about city ordinances, about noise levels, mm. blah 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 blah. Yeah. But if you try to use the argument of okay, well, we have collective rights, that I don't think that would fly. Mm. So that's that's an interesting question, somewhat separately, but it's something for us to think about us Muslims. Yeah. To to perhaps start thinking of ourselves as collectives and as a larger collective, as the ummah, yeah. right? Now, that's very interesting. I mean, I suppose, as you said, liberalism focuses on the individual and any attempt at this stage after 9-11 mm. for Muslims to solicit these collective rights will be probably attempts in, in vain. I mean, maybe the United right. States is, is slightly different, right? you know, uh, because they do have these strong constitutional rights mm. uh, to... That, that protect religion. But right. as we can see, the Muslim community is an exception, even mm. in the United States for, right. for many lawmakers. And or in the UK, for example, um, Jews do actually, they apply their Sharia to a certain extent, yeah, right? Yeah. They have the halakha, right? They're yeah, allowed to apply yeah. to a certain extent. Yeah. In the United States, you of course, you have the Amish and whatnot. Mm. They don't necessarily have a legal, a different legal system, yeah, but they yeah. have their own sort of communities. Absolutely. But, Let's be honest, that's not going to happen for Muslims no. anytime soon. No. Right? Yeah. 
So can I turn now to uh, the challenges Muslims face mm. when they make the move from the West to uh, a country like Turkey or to a city mm. like Istanbul? Uh, because we can sometimes have an over-romanticized notion of what it means to live in, in these countries. So Definitely. paint a picture of the challenges that a Muslim may face if they move to right. Turkey, for example. Well, I think one of the reasons why people up until now have been maybe reluctant to discuss hijrah is because it's often seen as like this naive romantic idea and to be honest a lot of the proponents of hijrah for a while were very naive in the way they approached the muslim world hmm. um so I, one of the things i want to get out of this podcast is to say no actually you can have a very intellectual discussion about this problem right and you can be very practical in how you talk about it it doesn't have to be naive or over romanticized yeah but at the same time the other extreme is that we say, oh, well, sort of uh, the inherent secularism in social sciences where people say, in migration studies, for example, where they say, oh, people never migrate for religious reasons. It's always just economic, political reasons. Mm -hmm. No, people do actually decide to change their entire lives simply for the sake of religion. Mm -hmm. And there's also, you know, the other extreme of, you know, we as Muslims should only be loyal to our nation state. Why are you talking about this? Just focus on being a good citizen. Yeah. Right. For me, it's like, you know, you can be, you can contribute. If we're talking about civic contribution, you can, you can make a positive contribution wherever you are. Right. That, that should be a wider ethos. That's not just linked to America or linked to the UK. It's just wherever I am, I want to give back to people. Mm -hmm. Right. I want to give back to humankind. I want to give back to the, the ummah, hmm. right? So going back to talking about, you know, over romanticizing hijrah, I think that's that's definitely true. And so, you know, I I once I I met this uh, I met this woman who had immigrated from the UK, and she said, "Oh, I made hijrah here." Hmm. And then she asked me, it was just such a simple question. It was like, "How do I use the metro or something?" Hmm. And it wasn't like, "How do I use the metro in Turkey?" It was literally like. How does one use the metro? <laughs> and I, I thought to myself, you know, I tried my best. I explained. And then I just thought to myself, I said, this lady is going to have, she's going to have a hard time here. Mm. She's either going to leave very soon or she's going to have a rough time of it for the next year before she lives, before she learns how to live in the world outside right. of wherever she was. Right. Right. So are you saying that some Muslims from the West can be quite snobbish <laughs> about, uh, you know, about uh, the Muslim world? And Yeah. So there's there's two separate things, right? Yeah. One is, yeah, there is um, snobbish, maybe is the way Snobbery to... Snobbery. Yeah. yeah. Part of that. And I think, you know, you could just say Western exceptionalism mm. or American exceptionalism. Right. It still exists. And it exists even among people who make hijrah here, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and that's actually one of the reasons why I want more Muslims to make hijrah. Yeah. It's because when you're here, eventually at some point, you're going to have to drop the Western exceptionalism, right? Yeah. It's just, I think so. Give me, give me an example of, the, of where right. you've seen that Western exceptionalism. Right. And don't say that, you know, I take taxis right. everywhere and you, you take buses. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's, that's not necessarily Western exceptionalism. Yeah. No, I, it's, it's just a wider way of... A, there's an adab that we should have as Muslims when yeah. we talk about our Muslim brothers and sisters, True. and when we talk about Muslim countries, mm. right? Um, so, so, for example, some of, some Sufi texts, for example, will mention that it's from the adab of a Muslim or for someone who goes on the Sufi path to not say anything about a country that would make the inhabitants of that country that they wouldn't like hearing it, even behind their back. It's right. not saying it to their face. It's yeah. like even saying it behind their back. Yeah. The food is not so good. Right, food. right. Right. Which, I mean, many of us, you know, we do make those sort of remarks yeah. uh, sometimes in public, sometimes in private, but mm -hmm. that's not, that's not from our adab for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. That's maybe a separate thing, but I think, listen, the West definitely, I think a lot of Muslims are still living in 1989 and the Berlin Wall is falling, <laughs> or they're still living in 1992 yeah. and Fukuyama is declaring the end of history, yes. you know? Well, history, history has come back. <laughs> yes. And, um... Actually, when we talk, for for example, when we talk about standards of living, a lot of Muslims in the West, one of the reasons why they're reluctant to make hijrah is they think that, oh, it's just so much better here, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that might be true for the country where they come, through, come from, but it's not true of the entire world. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, much of East Asia, so Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, even China, 
and the Gulf, I argue, have a better standard of living than we do in the West. Yeah, probably. and we we don't realize that. Yeah, and then I would argue that places like Turkey, Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, are nearly approaching it, mm. right? And then it becomes a question of okay, so there's a little bit of trade off in your standard of living, mm. but is that what makes you happy? If you think it is, look at the depression rates in the West right now. Mm. It's a serious issue. We spend. I, I I heard this statistic for this the other day. It's in the billions of dollars mm. that we spend per year on mental health. Mm. It's 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 actually crazy, right? Whereas um, this may no longer be the case, but at least for one year, the happiest country in the world was Pakistan. Right. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not necessarily saying, oh, it's, everyone it's makes the food. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's the biryani. I'm <laughs> yes, sure. Right. Um, but so there's also. So there is a, a material aspect to it, but I think the immaterial aspect is even more important. Mm. So the other day I was walking home from a cafe where I was working and I said, you know, I said, Salam, I said, how are you doing? Kola, and I hope it comes well. I basically just said Salam and I counted it out. I said it to about maybe seven or eight people on the way home. Mm. You know, some of them were beggars, some of them were shopkeepers, but they're just people you see every single day. Yeah. In my neighborhood, there's a fat dog, and I know exactly where that fat dog lies down every single day. Mm -hmm. And that might sound silly, but it's actually important for you as a human being to to have to have a neighborhood, mm -hmm. right? So part of what is happening in the West is we haven't just lost; we've lost communities, we've lost neighborhoods because of urban design, so on and so forth, and we've lost families mm -hmm. in a lot of cases, yeah. right? Outside of the Muslim community, even the Muslim community to a certain degree. So human beings are not meant to, you know, live in a box, drive to work, sit in front of a laptop, drive back home in a box, and then re repeat rents, just live for the weekend for two days, yeah. enjoy your weekend, and then go back to the same routine. Yeah. That's not how we're meant to live. We're meant to live in communities. We're meant to live in neighborhoods. We're meant to live in families. Let's talk about other challenges. Um, you know, elections mm. have just come around, and we know that a sizable number of, of Turks have voted for nationalist parties. Um, and many, not all, but many of these nationalists do have right. a very uh, problematic or un-Islamic view, let's put it like that, yeah. towards migration and towards right. foreigners. And we saw, you know, I don't know how typical it is, but we saw clips on social media of, of Turkish exceptionalism and, you know, mm. the, the idea that those from Africa and Asia are somehow lesser yeah. to, yeah. to those from, from Turkey. Now, how do we, uh, how, well, what, what are, is there a challenge with mm. certain a certain mindset in these countries which really hate migrants and Muslims from other parts of, of the world? Right. No. So there's definitely a challenge. Mm. Uh, it's not it's not worth denying. It, it mm. definitely existed. It right. affected me, even me, on like a I don't know if I would say daily life, but it was definitely something that was part of my life for a bit. Really. But yeah, definitely. Explain that. What What do you mean? Sorry. It was just the general animus in the air, right? Mm. Where um, the opposition, and interestingly, this didn't meet a lot of Western uh, opposition or a lot of uh, Western cries about human rights, so on and so forth. Mm. But the opposition was basically running on a very xenophobic platform and it worked right. to a certain degree. I mean, it yeah. didn't work enough to get them in power, yeah. but it worked in the sense that people felt more empowered to... And and you're entirely right that there there is an Islamophobic aspect to specifically to certain forms of nationalism here, mm. right? Um, I don't want to say that all nationalists are the same. Mm. You have to remember it, Turkey is a very complicated country. Yeah. Not all Turkish nationalists think the exact same, yeah. right? Actually, some Turkish nationalists are totally fine with Muslims, mm. even foreign Muslims to a certain degree. Right. So it's it's definitely more complicated than that. But there is um, part of it is the Kemalist legacy. Um, specifically, you know, so in, in the neighborhood where I live, this might be a bit silly because we're talking about food, but mm. on one street, there's literally five burger places mm. and one pizza joint. Yeah. And then one person opens up a falafel shop and mm. everyone's losing their mind. No way. Right. Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, there wasn't protests in front of the falafel shop, but you yeah. get my point Yeah. where for some reason... You know, somebody opens up a falafel shop and now it's a threat to Turkish identity. Hmm. But somehow, and this this burger place literally says Turkish burger, it says hmm. Turk burger, hmm. right? It's like, wait, so burgers can become Turkish, but falafel can't, hmm. right? It's, hmm. it's very interesting. Yeah. And of course, there's a lot of history there. 
So listen, I'm not going to sweep that under the rug, but here's here's my perspective is like, listen, we as Western Muslims are very familiar with xenophobia leaving, leading up to elections. Yeah. That's not anything different right. than what we have in the West. Some people might use that as an argument against Hijrah. Yeah. I don't because for me, it's like, okay, would I rather face xenophobia from fellow Muslims or from non-Muslims? Mm. And to me, to a certain degree, I realize, listen, after after colonialism, after the collapse of the caliphate, after nation states came, we were separated, it's not going to be easy. If you have a process of re umatization whatever you want to term it, that's not going to be a pretty process, like any human process. Yeah. And so there's going to be contestation along the way. Mm. But the way I think of it is this, I don't care if you don't like me, mm. I'm part of the ummah. Mm. So my legal legitimacy to live in this country comes from the Turkish state, comes from having a residence permit, from paying taxes, et cetera. But my moral legitimacy of being here, whether you agree with it or not, is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. It's not from you. Because like in the Quranic verse I said earlier, it's Arad Allah. It's not your earth. It's, it's Allah's earth. Mm. Um, so I am, so for me, even though, to be honest, it affected even me, you know, uh, to a certain degree during that period, I think it's worth it. Mm. I think it's worth it. And, and a lot of, listen, a lot of Muslims in the West think it's worth it as well. Right. They think it's worth it to go through what they go through every single election cycle. And that's their decision. But if it's worth it, to remain in America, if it's worth it to remain in the UK, why isn't it worth it in the case of Turkey? Right. Or why isn't it worth it in the case of the Muslim world? Yeah. And in the case of, of uh, deepening ties between Muslims. So, okay, let's take aside the, the nationalists, the secularists, who may have some level of animus, and I agree, we can't uh, tarnish, we can't say everyone is the same, and it's a Definitely very complex not, yeah. political landscape. But let's talk about the religious Muslims for now. I mean, yeah. How, um, back to that word, how ummatic, yeah. how mm. embracing are the religious Muslims towards Muslims from around the world? It's interesting. It's not uh, necessarily an easy question to answer. Mm. So, for example, if you look, even the majority of Ak Party voters, for example, are not entirely in favor of some of the government policies. Mm. That doesn't necessarily mean they're saying, oh, send all the Syrians back. They they think, and some of it's misinformation, they think the government gave too much, for example, okay. or they think because there's an economic crisis, the government should focus more on Turks at the yeah. time, right? Um, so you have that, but then, you know, you also do on sort of like, on a, on, so it's, it's interesting. So when you talk about nationalism in Turkey, is nationalism... Is there a possibility that nationalism in Turkey is actually increasing because Turkey is becoming less of a nation state, so to say, mm. that it's changing on the ground and certain people don't like that. Mm. And so there's a blowback to that. Right. So is that a short term thing or is that a long term thing? Mm. And then there's also parts where, listen, nationalism is on is on the rise everywhere in the world, globally. Right. It, it, the the rise of the far right is a global phenomenon. Mm. That's not limited to Turkey or even limited to Europe. Yeah. So part of it's economics, part of it is migration, the level of migration here. Um, but perhaps this is just because of the circles I'm in. When on the ground, I see, I see Turks that are marrying Syrians. Mm -hmm. I see Turks that are marrying Egyptians. I see. Um, on the ground, for example, in Fatah, which is maybe the epicenter of Syrians or Syrian life here in Istanbul, yeah. arguably, yeah, uh, I would see Syrians who would make their Turkish wasn't very good, but they would make jokes with their Turkish friends, and the Turks would also, you know, make jokes in Arabic, mm -hmm. right? And you could see that sort of daily life interaction, yeah. Um, which, interestingly enough, if you look at the people who voted for the most far right party here, which is Zafar Partisi, mm. right? So these are the people that it's literally their party platform where they run buses that say send all the send the refugees back, right? That's like or it's literally the refugees will go. Mm. That's literally like the campaign. Right. If you look at where they got the highest rates, it wasn't actually where there were lots of Syrians. Mm. It was other places. Right. Which is, you know, sort of a universal universal phenomenon of people um hating or people not understanding people that they don't actually interact with sure right yeah so 
I'm perhaps a bit more optimistic about that future than a lot of people are. Um, uh, it's a point I could have made earlier, but uh, is Turkish society secularizing or mm. is it becoming more Islamic? Right. It's it's actually, it's not very clear. Mm. I think it's not as clear cut as a lot of people think it is. So if you look throughout the Middle East, mosque attendance has been going up for a very long time. Um, so for example, there's a statistic that shows that one of the critiques of the Ak Party government has been, oh, they're just building mosques. These people just love building mosques. Yeah. But when you look at the mosque ratio, it's actually more or less the same as it was even in the 80s. Okay. It's It's been very consistently one mosque for every 1,000 people. And that's more or less the same. It's been, I think it was a change from 1.8 mosques to like 1.3 or 1.2. Mm. Like that's not a huge difference, mm. right? So, and and when you add, when you pull people whether or not they pray, numbers show that people are, it's going up. Mm. And that's all across the Middle East, actually. Mm. But then at the same time, you do, um, Turkey does exist in the world. There's globalization, there's westernization, there's specifically Americanization that's happening in Turkey. Mm. And so you also have that. So it's a very, it's a mix, it's a very complicated picture. And part of the problem is, you know, you can run a statistic saying, oh, Turks say they are becoming less religious. Well, they say they are becoming less religious, but what if that's how you define religious? Mm. What if they're wrong? <laughs> what if the person is self-reporting that they're becoming less religious, but in some ways they're becoming more religious in other ways, mm. right? So that's something that's, it's, it's, it's a very difficult thing to, to keep statistics on, right? In some ways, it may be easier to just say, you know, how many times do you pray a day? How many do you wear the headscarf? Do you not wear the headscarf? Mm. Right. Just like sort of very quantifiable indicators. Yeah. So I, once again, this is just me on the ground. I think it's actually more complicated. Mm. And I've noticed that, so you have a slight decrease maybe in, in Muslims among Turks, mm. but also that the people who are religious are actually becoming more religious. Right. So uh, what I, do you do with that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think many would uh, would attempt to translate the election results and, yeah. and draw some broader uh, analysis about the status of Muslims or Islam versus secularism. Yeah, that's, can that's you do not, that? No, no, no. That's Why? not that's not entirely accurate because yeah. there are also there are people who are not necessarily overtly religious who do vote for who vote for Erdogan, mm. and they vote for him based on economic performance, based on political so on and so forth, mm. right? So not not every person who votes for Ak Party or votes for other one is necessarily in quote unquote Islamist mm. or a religious Muslim, mm. even if that is the majority of the constituency. Mm. Um, on top of that, you actually also had Muslims who were voting against Erdogan in the last election yeah. for certain reasons. A lot of it's economic, um, even though that number was not as high as people thought it was going to be. And then you also have the Kurdish issue where right. so the Kurds and or Kurdish people, I, I don't like it when people say the Kurds, mm. right? Um, so Kurdish people basically um, mostly voted for the opposition candidate. Mm. But the majority of Kurds are actually very religious people. Okay. And historically, many of them voted for AK Party. So you shouldn't just look at, you know, the, uh, was it red versus yellow or red versus blue? Yeah. You can't just look at where is red and say, oh, they're all seculars. Yes. Not necessarily. It's more complicated. Now there was a discussion uh, on social media a few years back, uh, maybe a few, maybe a year back, uh, and it was a a, a a Turkish person venting frustration, their frustration against Western Muslims who come to Istanbul mm. and and sort of disturb the cultural uh, balance, or at least disturb uh, what she saw as sort of the the ethics of Istanbul. And mm. I think she went as far as to call them colonialists. Colonialists. They yeah. were. They were. Um, colonizing Istanbul and, and um, exploiting the country yeah. because of the, the relative weakness of the uh, Turkish lira. Right. Um, I don't know if you saw that discussion and, I did. and what was your reflection right. on that? So, I mean, I have a couple of reflections. First mm -hmm. off, we should acknowledge, as I said earlier, I think even Muslims who make hijrah here sometimes do have a certain amount of Western exceptionalism mm -hmm. or can act in a very privileged manner mm -hmm. that's not very respectful to the native population. I have, I have an issue with that. Yeah. But I, I think it's maybe not as prevalent as some people might think, mm. right? I think it's certain communities, certain, right? Yeah. Um, so that's one thing. But I think 
it's actually, if anything, it's kind of ironic because if anything, it's the opposite of colonialism. Really? If anything, it's decolonialism mm. because colonialism, what is colonialism? Colonialism is a process by which a more powerful country will basically take the resources of another country. They will occupy it in some sense and then use that to extract resources. That's one form of colonialism. Another form of colonialism, mm. which is probably the one that's more maybe what they're going for is settler colonialism, right? Mm -hmm. Is that the home country sends out people mm -hmm. and then they have, you know, they basically just take over the entire country. Mm -hmm. Well, that's complete exaggeration, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> I mean, this isn't like Australia with the Arabic, uh, this isn't like, you know, Zionism occupying Palestine or something, right? Yes. And B, on an economic level, what you're doing is actually the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. You're taking wealth, you're taking resources, human resources as well from the West, mm. and you're putting it here. And a lot of Muslim countries for a very long time suffered from brain drain. Mm. And in some sense, there's a little bit of brain drain that's happening in Turkey, but there's also a brain gain mm -hmm. that's happening at the same time yeah. of other people who are coming, lots of Muslims who are coming to Turkey. Mm. So if anything, it's the exact opposite of colonialism. Right. Um, a lot of this is politics over housing prices and housing prices have have shot through the roof recently. Mm -hmm. That's not the fall of foreigners. That's larger economic processes. That's, that's if anything, that's happening globally because we live in a global capitalist world, mm. right? And that's just how housing markets are a commodity, yeah. right? Yeah. But at the end of the day, I would argue that Muslims coming here is actually exactly what you should encourage because this is the exact opposite of colonialism. And it could have, you have no idea where that will lead. It can have very positive influences can have very positive contributions to Turkish society, right? to Turkish academia, for example. Okay. Now let's talk about uh, Turkey as a place to, to, to build one's Islamic knowledge and Islamic mm -hmm. capacity. Um, I, uh, it used to be the case that Muslims would go to, say, Egypt or, mm. or go to uh, Syria. Syria was a very right. favoured destination, especially for young uh, Muslims who wanted to learn uh, the Islamic sciences in greater depth, uh, to learn ulum, to learn, yeah. you know, the the various Islamic disciplines. Of course, Syria now is is a problem. Mm. Uh, Egypt is becoming more and more repressive, and and so people favor not to go there sometimes. And and mm. you know there are issues there. Um, is Turkey a place where one can find good quality mm. Islamic education of all levels? Definitely. Really? Um, it's, I think it's becoming a more popular destination for Tulab al mm. That's partially, you mentioned Syria. Most of the Syrian ulama are actually here in Turkey now. Mm. Um, interestingly, uh, most of the, the students of knowledge who study with Syrian scholars are not Syrian. Um, they're not even Westerners. Really? A lot of them are Central Asian. Really? You go to any Syrian ma'ad in Istanbul, you will see the majority of students are from Kazakhstan and from Uzbekistan, mm. right? So this goes back to the previous point about, you know, expanding our map of, of how we visualize migration to Turkey, right? Mm. Um, so yeah, you have uh, Syrian ulama who are top class are now here. And there's also many Turkish and Kurdish scholars that are very underrated mm. that you can also study with here. So I, I think it's definitely increasing. And uh, partially it's also increasing specifically because as you mentioned, it's becoming more difficult to go to other countries, right? right? And unfortunately, uh, one of the considerations for Hijra for Talab al Ilm, which has a long historical present in our tradition, one of the problems with that is it doesn't really fit into most visas. So, you know, we don't have a special visa for Talab al Ilm, and most most countries in the Muslim world do not consider that under an education visa. Uh. Right. So, so how does one then navigate yeah. the, the bureaucracy? Uh, well, I mean, historically in, in Turkey, it was very easy. You just came here and you applied for a tourist residence permit. That's okay. become more difficult as of late because yeah. of the rate of migration. Yeah. And so historically, the Talab al ilm that were here were just on tourist residence permits, which are more difficult to get now. Right. So then one has to think about other options. What about day-to-day, -day, you know, I, not, not uh, you know, to the... Uh, to the degree by which someone uh, develops, you know, a, a very close, a very granular understanding of Islam, but just on a very basic, you know, because uh, I, I came across Muslims who, for example, migrated to the Gulf states, and they actually found mm -hmm. that the level of general Islamic learning in society was quite low, and they couldn't go to classes, and they couldn't really, 
some Gulf states mm. maybe more than others uh, mm. were like this. Like Dubai, for example, it, yeah. it became very difficult to to just go to simple classes to to get it, uh, mm. you know, as we can do in the West. Mm. Uh, are there Islamic activity? Is there Islamic activities here in in Istanbul for the ordinary person to attend? Oh, definitely. But then the question becomes: In what language? I in mean, English. I'll, in English, less so. It's mm. it's it's developing. Mm. And this is part of one of the things we wanted to do at uh, Meme at the Majlis of Istanbul Muslims, as uh -huh. I mentioned earlier at the yeah. very beginning. So we wanted to offer these sort of things, and there's other initiatives as well. But English is is the least, obviously. Right. Arabic, there's a lot more okay. because of the level of Arabs that are here and also because it's the language of Islamic scholarship. Yeah. But obviously the, the number one is Turkish. I mean, obviously. Right. So then it becomes a question of, uh, you know, what language do you speak? What are mm. you looking for? Okay. And finally, Thomas, um, we spoke earlier about how many Muslims who come to places like Turkey want to escape uh, the the dire situation where the liberal state is really asserting its values upon Muslim kids. But can we really escape that? We do live in a globalized world and there is a global monoculture. You walk into the standard, you know, Starbucks or the McDonald's and you will find everything you see in London or in New York. Um, so, you know, is it a panacea? Is, is coming to mm. Turkey or any Muslim country an absolute solution because, you know, because of the... I suppose the the impact uh, this uh, Americanization ha uh, of this culture is is having on yeah. on on the world. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, the global monoculture is uh, it's inescapable. Right, it's everywhere. Yeah. So if you're making hijra solely because you think there's no Starbucks in this country, you're you're clearly you are clearly mistaken. There there are Starbucks here. There are McDonald's here. There's Americanization that's happening mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. But I, I think some there's not a lot of the pressures we were talking about earlier, yeah. right? Um, and so, and and also we should say this: part of us reconnecting as an ummah is actually happening within globalization. Yes. So you have both that is happening as part of globalization, mm. right? So I think a unless if you want to move to like the deserts or mountains of Mauritania or wherever, you're mm. not going to escape it. So. For me, it's like, how do we as an ummah start reconnecting? And mm. let's start thinking about alternatives. Mm. And and that alternative, you can think about from the UK, you can think about from the US, but maybe you should also think about it here. And you should build a connection with your brothers here. You should have, you should engage in a dialogue with your Muslim brothers, even if you don't want to leave the West, at least engage in a dialogue with us mm. and start talking about alternatives and start talking about what it means to be part of this ummah. Thomas Abdel Qadir, it's been a pleasure speaking to you today here in Istanbul. Jazakallah khair for your time. Welcome. The pleasure was all mine. Please remember to subscribe to our social media and YouTube channels and head over to our website thinkingmuslim.com to sign up to my weekly newsletter. Jazakallah khair.